you for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Katie Soap. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton. Welcome everybody for coming today. Thank you. Um, just wanted to tell you quick about some other programming we have coming up. We have our Find Your Ancestors genealogy series starting in two weeks from today. Um, and then the day after, which um, is November 17th, we have another local author coming, Jim Gould, who's coming to talk about his coming of age novel. Um, so feel free to come and support those programs as well as any of the other programs we have at the library coming up this month. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that there's a bathroom to the left um, if you're needing that and water fountain as well. And um, I just wanted to thank the friends of the library for supporting our wonderful programming. Um, so today we have author Richard Wagner here today. He's a scholar and activist and was the first openly gay member of the Dane County Board of Supervisors where he served for 14 years. Um, in 1983, he was appointed co-chair of the Governor's Council on Lesbian and Gay Issues, which was the first in the nation. In 2005, he joined the Board of Fair Wisconsin to fight constitutional amendment against uh, marriage equality. And he retired in 2005 and has been writing for various avenues on Wisconsin's uh, gay history since then. Uh, he has his PhD in American History from UW-Madison, and he's written this wonderful book, um, Wisconsin's early gay history, which we're going to talk about today. So, everybody, welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. They have me wired for sound, so I hope you can hear me. And you know, yeah, I see not. So, okay, good. Um, I'm very pleased to be in this particular location for this talk uh, because if I can skip ahead a little bit to volume two, and this is a two volume effort, there's a pre Stonewall volume, which we're going to talk about today for her. Uh, but there's a post on wall volume coming out in uh, next June. Uh, it was in the 1970s that the Fox Valley Gay Alliance was organized, and uh, they were one of three early gay rights groups in the state. Uh, and they worked hard so that they could get the Appleton Public Library to agree to carry the Gay People Union News out of Milwaukee, uh, which was published in the early 70s for a whole decade. And, uh, they even worked long enough that the library director agreed to purchase more material, quote, reflecting an honest view of the subjects concerning homosexuality and the gay lifestyle. So hats off to the Appleton Public Library for that early effort of trying to embrace understanding and combating the ignorance of that so much existed about homosexuality. Um, I have a large postcard collection, which I use to illustrate some of these talks. This is just one about uh, Appleton. Uh, but uh, one that I often use in some of these talks is this sort of greetings from Wisconsin. And you see here uh, very iconic kinds of things, <coughs> deer, cranberries, cheese, uh, deer, hunter. Um, and uh, it's probably 1950s, if I have to guess, just from looking at the clothing styles. Uh, but it's a very one-sided view of Wisconsin. There's no women, there's no indigenous peoples, there's no minorities, there's certainly nobody who seems gay or lesbian in this view. So, insofar as this has been a dominant view of the picture of Wisconsin, part of my effort in writing this book, we've been here all along, is to try and change that perspective and say, there's more Wisconsin stories than what the predominant view is. And so, uh, that's what I tried to write in this volume, about Wisconsin's early gay history, it's all pre-Stonewall. And considering that it's pre-Stonewall, I'm challenging a little bit some assumptions. One, that there was no gay history before Stonewall. In fact, there was a lot. Uh, also, there's an assumption that most of gay history has occurred on the coast, uh, either in New York with Stonewall itself in 69, or earlier in California when you had the Madachin Society, one magazine, and the Daughters of the Lightest, which was founded in San Francisco, uh, going back to the 50s and 60s, pre-Stonewall there. In fact, Lily Fetterman has written an uh, article about the revolution actually began on the left coast, by which she in California, uh, rather than on New York. Uh, both of those views ignore, quote, flyover countries such as we are, and pretend that there was no gay history or even gay liberation. Uh, before then. And we use Stonewall as a marker for gay liberation uh, as an event. But I, we need to have a broader perspective, in my view, which I argue in the book. 
is that uh, liberation is really about individuals finding identity and building community. And that occurs in Wisconsin well before Stonewall. And that's part of what I tried to elicit in this book. Uh, that there were individuals who figured out how to express their non-normative lives, they built support networks, and by their own agency, in essence, liberated themselves well before Stonewall. Uh, one of the uh, jokes I've used about the title is, I could have changed it to sort of the glass half empty side and talk about Wisconsin's rampant homophobia, its occasional failures as some lesbians, gay men, and trans persons resisted. Uh, because the predominant story before Stonewall is really the structure of homophobia. Uh, it involves crime, it involves sickness, uh, all of those things that were used for cultural suppression about homosexuality in the period before Stonewall. So uh, some of the negative perceptions you see, sort of twisted men, demonic kinds of figures. You see you know, women sort of cross-dressed, manly kind of things. So these were the kinds of images sometimes that were out there. And so where to begin? Can I historians create hypotheses? I thought maybe in the Oscar Wilde trial, there might have been some coverage and you could find attitudes about homosexuality in Wisconsin. It proved to be a wonderful hypothesis. Tens of thousands of words were written in Wisconsin for the Wilde trials. Uh, he had toured here in the 1880s. Uh, he spoke at Racine, Milwaukee, and then across the river, uh, and, uh, but the trials in 1895 in London were extensively covered in Wisconsin. The stories were all wire services out of London, but the headlines, and there were often three or four, were all written locally by the editors, and there were editorials as well about them. So the themes that popped up in the coverage of the wild trial, and some of the Wisconsin papers had 30 stories. There were about three judicial proceedings over a period of a month and a half. And the 30 stories in a couple of the papers was the same number that the major papers like the New York Sun and the New York World had about the wild trial, too. So it was covered extensively. Uh, and the themes that pop up, criminality is totally the proper context for homosexuality. Uh, Wilde's loss of his home and goods was entirely appropriate for homosexuals to be stripped of their wealth. Uh, cultural suppression was a great idea. His plays were taken down from the West End of London. His books were withdrawn from the libraries in England. So, you know, God forbid anybody should see him by, by gay people. Uh, they also referenced sort of he was sick and weak. And then one other thing was that this was an otherness, an un-Americanness uh, about homosexuality. So, this was like a poll of Wisconsin in 1895. All negative. So, you begin to see the structure of homophobia that exists. And it's important to understand that structure when we get to the stories of men and women who are willing to sort of present themselves contrary to that structure. Uh, I also uh, looked at the lesbian novel, Well of Loneliness. This also was shunned. Uh, just noting something about some of the wild stories of the skip over, uh, is that, uh, they talked about the poet prisoner who looked worn and anxious. He appeared in the dock, Caleb Haggard. He was bankrupt. He was going to go to prison. So on the well of loneliness, there was not as much about this. This was in the 1920s. Uh, but there was a lot of controversy still. Uh, and uh, the Appleton Press was one of the big places in the state where I found some stories, interestingly enough. Uh, there was a reviewer uh, in the Appleton Press uh, who reviewed Hall's book that followed Well of Loneliness. Uh, the reviewer was named Eleanor Evelyn Lynn. I'm not absolutely sure she was from Appleton, even though she was writing in the Appleton paper, but she did mention that the local bookstore had the book, so she may have been a local, at least she or the editors had inserted the fact that the book was available here in Appleton. Uh, and in her review, she excoriated the censor and the stuffed shirt moralist who on a previous occasion condemned Radcliffe Hall. Uh, she also wrote about perversity. We stick our heads in the sand and refuse to see abnormality 
even though it most certainly does exist. So if you're an applicant, they were affirming that lesbianism, presumably as a perversity still, did exist an acknowledgement of our presence in some ways. Uh, so um, here in Appleton, as I said, there, there was sort of also expressed these negative views uh, over homophobia. Now, this, the apparatus of homophobia involved laws, police, courts, prisons, various investigations, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Uh, oops, Lawrence. Okay. Territory legislation. In 1836, Wisconsin gets separated from Michigan. Michigan's going to become a state. So we inherit the laws of Michigan. Uh, this slide is the territory of Tampa, down in Belmont. And <coughs> the laws of Michigan provide a three year penalty for sodomy. And sodomy is from the old Tudor law. Crimes against nature was the definition of the crime of sodomy. Uh, and uh, three years wasn't enough for the Wisconsin territorial legislation. They have to defy. So immediately hard line in Wisconsin about homosexuality. Uh, and they were still going at it as late as 1951 when the legislature passed a law to deny driver's license to anybody convicted of sexual offenses like stuff. Now the police uh, were the folks who were enforcing uh, the uh, sodomy laws and other uh, mood and lascivious behavior laws. Uh, this is a shot of the Milwaukee Police Station uh, and I was able to look at the Milwaukee and Madison police reports. Uh, Milwaukee, in, during the decade of the 1910s, averaged seven arrests annually for sodomy, with high of 17 in 1919. In the 1930s, Milwaukee was averaging 13 a year, with a high of 19 in 1931. So it was not an uncommon charge, and you have to realize that often, once one was arrested, they would plead down charges, so there were probably many more than just those that appear as official sodomy in the record. Uh, the Madison Police reports in this early 20th century period list all the sodomy arrests amongst the important crimes, like murder and major theft. So if you were caught as a gay person, you were right there with the murderers as well. Uh, in 1939, the Madison Police Chief cited an unusual case under his sodomy heading. Two women were arrested. Uh, and uh, he thought this was very unusual. Clearly, the police quite didn't understand the common law definition, because normally you had to have a male member for sodomy to be charged. And so for the women, this wouldn't work. Uh, anyway, one got sent to a sanatorium, and the other back to her hometown from this 1939 case. Uh, Oshkosh down the lake was thought to be a hotbed for homosexuality. Uh, and Actually, uh, in 1908, Milwaukee was listed amongst the eight homosexual capitals of America. So, uh, things were happening here. Uh, Juno Park was one of the places where homosexuals were long known for congregating in Milwaukee. Uh, there was the case of Ralph Carino, or as she was born, uh, Cora Anderson. Probably an early transfer of some information in the language didn't exist back then, to be sure about that. Uh, but Ralph had presented himself as a man for 10 years. He was married to a woman. Uh, and then he had an affair with another woman, and his wife ratted him out to the police, uh, which resulted in a court case. Uh, in the case, he said, my heart and soul are more those of a man than a woman. You know, the information about trans people back then is so pragmatic. Uh, fragment that it's hard to know exactly what to take, but clearly it is possible. Uh, now, uh, in those cases where some people would appeal their sodomy con convictions, it would go to the Supreme Court. They had no appeals courts back in those days. And uh, the, the local courts often didn't create much of a record or keep records, so the best records we have talking about these cases is at the Supreme Court of Wisconsin. And in 1905, in an opinion, they wrote, we are unwilling to soil the pages of our reports with lengthened discussion of the loathsome subject. In 1928, in an opinion, the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, the crime itself is so repulsive and detestable that one is loath to believe defendant's guilt, yet we must recognize the offense existed in ancient times 
and recent legislation broadening the common law definition indicates that modern culture has not succeeded in abolishing the crime. And in 1938, where there was an alleged school for sodomites existing in Waukesha County of all Texas, uh, there was ample evidence of the defendant's association with boys about 18 years of age, suggesting a disposition to indulge in the practice. Now, this is one of the things that prosecutors in the state grappled with in some of these cases, is that you have two individuals who may be engaged in the sexual act, and if one of them complained, you had a he said, he said instances, or perhaps in the case of two women, who has a she said, she said. Uh, but usually courts don't want to convict on just one witness, and so what the prosecutors in Wisconsin did is they tried to enter into evidence that people were a homosexual, they were known as a homosexual, and that this was corroborating evidence besides perhaps the accuser. Uh, sometimes the courts went along with that dubious theory, other times they didn't. Uh, but it shows that severe status, not necessarily criminal acts, was part of what could get you in trouble. Now, if you did get convicted, you ended up here, law upon was the state prison, and uh, there was uh, uh, Crowbar Hotel, so it's called, the old cells. They're still there, I had to tour it some years ago. Uh, there was a professor at the University, John Gillen, who was a sociologist, uh, and in the 1930s, he was basically studying criminology, and he wrote a book called The Wisconsin Prisoner, a study of some crime of genesis. Uh, it didn't get published till 46, right after the war. There was a big paper shortage during the war. Uh, but the research is basically 1930s. Uh, and one of his theories was he wanted to compare those folks who were in Wuhan to other family members and see if he could figure out what the origins of crime were. Didn't really conclusively come to academic judgments about that. But there were some 20 prisoners who were in Wuhan who were there for sodomy. And so he did take their cases. And what you saw was that, for the most part, these folks who came to courthouses, like here, not again, uh, they had trials by judges, no juries. They often didn't have defense attorneys. Uh, and some of them were sentenced to uh, Wapon Central State Hospital for the criminally insane, as well as to the prison. It showed sort of the merging into the sickness scene uh, that was going on. Um, oops. One of the people, who was there was from Mantuak, here showing uh, a Wenzel Baser. Uh, he was sentenced in 1932. Uh, he was a Bohemian uh, immigrant family, unskilled laborer, and that's the other interesting thing is that there are a number of working class folks who are in this sample from Wapan. Uh, and the, the research notes uh, taken by a graduate assistant said the reason he was not prosecuted on prior information was the high reputation of other members of his family. So, and this pops up in a number of other cases. They were sort of known as homosexuals in the community, but they might not have arrested them right away. Uh, his uh, crime was that he performed oral sex on people who were in their late teenage years, uh, paying them 50 cents was apparently the going rate for this enjoyment at that point. Uh, he had an ambition to become a priest, but he didn't have the intellectual capacity for theology. And it was referenced that boys called him Powder Puff Joe due to the extreme care and dress and use of rouge. So again, this may be a person bending some of the gender norms or not. Again, there's not enough information to make it a definite. Uh, but the chief of police in this case uh, noted he was definitely perverted in sexual instincts for many years. So, um, you get these glimpses of folks who have come from around the state. Uh, next, I want to turn to these two remarkable ladies, Charlotte Partridge and Miriam Frink. Uh, Charlotte Partridge was a teacher of English, uh, and Miriam, no, she was a teacher of art, and Miriam Frink was a teacher of English. Uh, and they met at Milwaukee Downer College, uh, and part of their compensation was rooms in the college where they could live. But once they formed their domestic friendship, which was the polite name for lesbians in those days, uh, they moved off campus and got an apartment. They later built a joint art studio on the North Shore of uh, Lake Michigan. 
and met in a house in Beansville in suburban Milwaukee. Uh, they uh, jointly founded uh, the Leighton School for the Arts in Milwaukee, which was in the basement of the Leighton Gallery uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, and uh, Partridge, they took over the basement for the School of Art. Partridge brought the life models in her progressive teaching, which was something slightly scandalous and conservative in Milwaukee, that you would have actual life models for art drawing classes. Uh, when they went out west on a trip, Frank packed a revolver just to be ready for any of those cowboys who might be in uh, And uh, they hired various state faculty for the Layton School and uh, nurtured uh, many artists there. They were very involved in civic life. During the New Deal art programs, Partridge ran part of the Wisconsin program. And when she had to step down, uh, Frank stepped in for her. And then when Partridge came back, Frank turned it back over to her. Uh, they were very involved with Meta Berger and civic life. And she was the widow of uh, Congressman uh, Berger uh, in that area. Uh, so uh, you had this early domestic partnership, which was fairly public in the Milwaukee life. Then I want to talk about Ralph Warner, who I dubbed Wisconsin's first out gay man. Uh, he was a teacher from Racine, but in the summer he lived in Cooksville, Wisconsin, in Rock County. He bought this house of the 1850s, a uh, red brick house in a little town that had Daniel Webster was an investor in. Uh, has a village green, and very New england -y kind of a thing. Uh, but he became a favorite of lady journalists. He was featured in like House and Garden, uh, Ladies Home Journal, uh, and, and a couple other publications. And they all talked about his non-normative behaviors, uh, that he did the decorating, he did the cleaning, he did the cooking, he did the dishwashing. They always asked whether well, it has to be a Mrs. Ralph. No, there was no Mrs. Ralph. It was just Ralph who was doing all these things. And in one story, if he missed anything, they talked about the pansies that were embroidered on the cushions in the house. So they were using coded language and talking clearly about a non-normative man, uh, in this case, in this small village in Cooksville. Uh, but he was fairly straightforward in presenting himself. Uh, one of those people who wrote about him was Betty Cass. I call her the journalist godmother to gays from the 20s and 30s. Uh, she also covered the boys at the Pendarvis, uh, uh, Edgar and, and Bob Neal, uh, Edgar Helen and Bob Neal, who restored the Darvis and ran a Cornish uh, little uh, tea house and antique shop from the Darvis. Uh, and she also was a friend with uh, Edward Harris Heath and also with Keith Crutchett, two other gay men who I talked about in my book. So um, then I turn to World War II. And this really established medicalization at a national level. As the Army used psychiatrists to try and screen out gay men and lesbians from the medical from the military services. It failed miserably, as Alan Burby showed in his book, with a huge number of oral interviews of the tens of thousands of gays or more who actually served in the military in the fight against fascism. Uh, and there's a couple of stories that come from Wisconsin. Uh, one was a Wally Jordan from Rhinelander up in the North Woods. Uh, Wally uh, struck up correspondence. In those days before the internet, you had pen pals. And Wally struck up a pen pal relationship from a science fiction magazine uh, with Jim Kepner. And Kepner would later go on to be one of the early activists associated with one magazine and with the first eight archives in the country uh, in California. Uh, but there's some 40 letters exchanged between Wally Jordan and Jim Kepner mainly during the war period, but a couple into the 1950s. And uh, Jordan's describing for him all of the gay soldiers and their activities at a camp in Arizona. And then he goes to North Africa, where he talks about hundreds of gays forming a social circle in North Africa, even though an admiral was sent to investigate this circle. There were enough clerks and other folks who got the word around and nothing was found about it. Uh, he went on the beaches of uh, the invasion of Italy and was under fire. Uh, and uh, he talks about the North Woods before he got into the military. Uh, and a very active, 
homosexual life in the North Woods of Wisconsin. Um, you know, you did have those lumber camps where you had all these men up there, and sometimes they would dance together with one of them with a the arm sleep, saying, who's about to take the woman's role? Uh, there was another gentleman from Eagle River, Wisconsin, uh, who uh, also wrote about a memoir for you, Lily Marlene, Robert Peters, uh, and he described the same-sex activity also during World War II uh, that he saw, and some even in Wisconsin uh, before that. After the war, uh, Jordan came back to uh, Rhinelander and would go up to Hurley, which is known as a wide open town in northern Wisconsin. Uh, and Neferder wrote about it uh, as sort of the place the prostitutes served the miners and the bloggers up there. Uh, but uh, Jordan found actually gay life crazy going wild up in Hurley as well. Uh, another thing that happened during World War II was that. Truax Field, shown here, was quite set apart from Madison, and it was an Army Air Force base. They trained radio operators and radio repair technicians at the base. Uh, and uh, there was a professor at the university, Dr. Servinghaus, uh, who conducted a study of a number of these airmen, uh, some 20 uh, again, who had been identified as homosexual because they revealed themselves either to doctor or a chaplain or an officer, not so much about confidentiality in those days. Uh, and so they were identified in the Marine Psych Ward as homosexuals. And he had a theory of endocrine origins of homosexuality. So he took urine samples from these 20 guys, tried to compare urine samples from another group of men presumed not to be homosexual, looking to see if there were more female rather than male hormones in these guys. In the science on this. Uh, nevertheless, he took their stories and uh, <coughs> remarkable things. Uh, there were sort of some this little newsletter that was put out about the classes there at Truex Base. And there was some of the scourge and weep culture that the Burby also talked about during World War II. You see in the center the man dressed up in a women's costume with a long nose, supposedly giving advice uh, on the local radio at the base as well as in their newsletter. Uh, and uh, uh, this shows the hospital out there. Perhaps this is where some of those folks were, were studying. Uh, also, Bob Neal and Edgar Hunt from Mineral Point closed up in Darvis. People did not have the gas to go driving down to Mineral Point to go visit them. So they moved to Madison and they worked out at the base. Uh, Bob Neal particularly helped run the kitchens out there uh, and so there were other gay folks there as well as the soldiers who were on the base. Uh, they ran a bus from the base down to the Capitol Square, which was very convenient because the study also revealed that was a prime cruising area during World War I, or excuse me, World War II, and actually continued for some decades thereafter. But the study was remarkable because of the comments, not because they proved their hormone theory at all, uh, but the comments that they made about these folks in 1945, they said, all these cases were extreme types, had been aggressively homosexual, both actively and passively, since late childhood and early adolescence. They also noted they had participated apparently without conflict in a wide variety of homosexual practices. These homosexual stories were remarkably similar. Uh, so again, they're saying there's fairly widespread documented homosex going on. Uh, and then, on the sickness question, they observed the cases would be considered extremely questionable from the standpoint of profiting from any therapy. In fact, therapy was not requested or desired by any of them. Here you see that the gay folks themselves are rejecting the sickness label that's trying to be applied to them uh, and had affirmed their own lives. Uh, the doctors, in their own professional judgment, noted that in none of these cases was there a true neurotic type of conflict over homosexuality as such. The soldiers were not unaware that the military could bring damage to them, but in their own view, they had no neuroses over who they were. Again, a remarkable statement about the rejection of the sickness. It was trying to be applied as part of the medicalization about homosexuality. 
And then it was just sort of a throwaway comment that really sort of blew me away when I found it. It said, four of them were known to be members of an organized group. 1945, before Stonewall, the organized group of homosexuals operated here in Wisconsin. So there is something before Stonewall to find and look. Now, uh, after the war, one of the big things was the Lavender Scare. <clears throat> one magazine uh, here in 1960 uh, published this cover, Are Homosexual Security Risks? And part of the reason for the Lavender Scare was the witch hunts led by Senator Joe McCarthy, a uh, native, or at least someone who was associated with the Appleton area here. Uh, and uh, it's often forgotten today, in fact, many of the people who write about McCarthyism totally ignore the fact that he attacked both queers and communists. Uh, but uh, it's quite documented in the record. Uh, McCarthy was praised by Wisconsin's Republican boss, Tom Coleman, in a strategy memo that he sent on behalf of various Midwestern Republican chairpersons to the National Republican Committee. And he cited McCarthy's work exposing homosexuals in government as a winning issue for the National Republican Party. John Wingard, who was a political journalist who actually was very popular and based in this area of Fox Valley, noted more rank and file interest in concern about the revelation about homosexuality in government circles than about the more explosive issue about communist sympathizers was true at the time. Uh, and it was noted that three-fourths of McCarthy's early mail was about gays and not reds. And so it was clearly understood that he was against both. McCarthy's own words and sex deviates all are considered security risks. And if you're against McCarthy, you're either a communist or word I won't use in polite company uh, about uh, gay folks. So uh, this guy from Wisconsin caused quite a stir at the national stage. Uh, and the Lavender Scare, uh, written by David Johnson, shows that there were actually more gays and lesbians fired from the federal government than there were communists, in part because we were easier to detect than the underground communists who were there. Uh, there's a wonderful new opera that I saw in Chicago this past year about fellow travelers uh, that's going to be in uh, Madison Opera uh, early next year. Uh, the FBI did surveillance of gays. These were some of the redacted publications of that surveillance. Uh, senator Wiley, who was the other senator from Wisconsin, also joined in. He attacked the post office for letting one magazine be sent through the mail and threatened that uh, he would try and improve the country's laws, uh, the Supreme Court, in one sentence uh, decision, uh, with actually no oral argument, said no, one can be sent through the mail, and sort of turned this aside. Uh, another thing that was happening after war was that you had a lot of servicemen who returning using the GI Bill. And so the number of students on campuses like in Madison just ballooned up. And one of the things that happened as a result of that was that what some of the deans described as an outbreak of homosexuality. Uh, and uh, I went through the student discipline records for the late 40s, 50s, and 60s from Madison campus. Uh, and there's some 50 cases of homosexuality. And they're all male homosexuals. There's no lesbians uh, being uh, arrested or investigated for uh, sexuality. Uh, but there were some 50 males. and. Uh, Amongst them are some 25 police interrogatories, either campus police or district attorney, asking questions about you know, when they began their sexual practices and all this sort of stuff. The most interesting question was, and this repeated itself throughout these interrogatories, have you committed the homosexual act? I happen to think the guys probably had more imagination than the officers <laughs> about the possible acts that might have been committed. Uh, the university policy was that if they caught somebody, they would suspend them uh, until they went to see a psychiatrist who would say that they were cured, and then they might readmit them to the university. But basically, they kept them out of the School of Medicine and the School of Education as not being appropriate for homosexuals to be in those fields. Uh, they would out people to their parents 
Uh, they would follow up with future employers who would be told their record. Uh, and uh, so it was quite damaging if you got caught up in this therapeutic discipline, as the university called it. Uh, there were particular two events in 48 where a whole circle of gays uh, were arrested and were featured in the newspapers. Some 12 were uh, in the papers for immoral charges in various cases. And then in 1962, there was what was called the Gay Purge, when the Dean of Men compiled a list of hundreds of homosexuals. They would call people in and ask them to name other homosexuals, uh, even if they didn't have evidence that those folks had committed a particular crime. Uh, one of the things in 48 was they did an investigation of this group called Hare's Foot. Hare's Foot was a theatrical troupe, but actually goes back to the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And they were so popular, they went on the road. And at that time, the university didn't want female and male students traveling on the special trains that would take this theatrical troupe around the state. So all the women's roles had to be assumed by men, who in essence were cross-dressing. Now, particularly following World War II, that attracted a fair number of the homosexuals in the university did the sort of investigation of Harris in 48. Uh, trying to see what could be done about trying to not have quite so many gay men performing cross-dressing uh, activity. Uh, nothing really came of that investigation, and they still continued cross-dressing until uh, the movement, uh, until the theater ended. Uh, another thing that I discovered was that one magazine published out of Los Angeles had a number of Wisconsinites who wrote to one so from them, and I was actually able to interview somebody who had actually subscribed to one magazine in the 1950s and 60s here in Wisconsin. But those who wrote to the magazine, and they published letters to the editors, that they just used initials, um, a Dr. K, this unidentified place, said, though everyone in this small town is convinced I am queer, I have a huge practice. My lover comes up often enough to be recognized and greeted on the streets, and no one seems to mind. Uh, another who thought himself not needing a magazine so much anymore, yet agreed wholeheartedly that it must be a great help to the younger men. From Green Bay, a writer observed in that area, some are discreet and some otherwise. Uh, some attacked internalized homophobia uh, that was expressed in the magazine in one vote from Wisconsin. How can this man ever hope that the world would ever accept the gay crowd, meaning even individuals among them? refused to accept others of their own kind. Uh, friends from Wisconsin sent money to sell the investigation self-discovery. So you had Wisconsin Knights who were participating in the early homophile movement uh, at that point. And uh, you see here one magazine, one of its fun covers on a December issue, Santa in high heels kicking them up. Uh, they had a lot of sense of humor as well as seriousness about their purpose. Um, there's also uh, the story of Betty Siebenthal. She was an author. Uh, she wrote mystery novels, published most of them under male pseudonyms, because it was easier to get published as a man than it was as a woman. Uh, but uh, she did publish a book of poetry acquainted with a chance of bobcats. Uh, and I think a series of those poems are dedicated to her lover, Mary Locke. Uh, they lived in a small town in Mount Horb in the Driftless area in western Wisconsin. And uh, they lived together in the Siebenthal uh, family home. They are actually buried side by side with a joint headstone in the Mount Horb Union Cemetery. Uh, and uh, just remarkable how they, able, they were able to lead their lives as well as another domestic friendship, uh, almost verging at that point on actual known lesbians. Uh, one of the gentlemen I want to talk a little bit about is Ted Pierce, shown here. He lived in Madison on Williamson Street for his entire life, uh, which covered most of the 20th century. I got to know him because uh, it's in the same neighborhood where I live. Uh, his family had a tailor shop in the Lorraine Hotel, which is the fanciest hotel in Madison. It had a governor's suite, things like that. Uh, and in discussions with him, he talked about how the elevator operators and busboys provide sexual services as part of the service for folks who are in the town. So 
again, you get the sense that there was a lot more homosexual activity going on than was being acknowledged in the sort of mainstream uh, discussions about Wisconsin. Uh, he also struck up a friendship with Will and Motley, who came up from Chicago to attend university. He wanted to play football, but it was too small to play football in a major Big Ten school. Uh, but Pierce and Motley maintained 40 years of correspondence back and forth. And Motley was a very successful African-American novelist. His works were praised by Eleanor Roosevelt in her column Day by Day, they were made into Hollywood movies. Uh, and at the end of his life, he was thinking about writing a gay novel. And uh, it may well have included some of the material from his interactions with Ted coming to Chicago, or he coming up here to Madison for football weekends and staying with Ted. Um, then you begin in the 50s to find even more visible presence of gays, and you start to get a geography of gay bars. One of the ones that uh, I had never heard about until I interviewed some very elderly gentleman was the Indian Room in the Manoa Hotel in Madison. Uh, one that begins to appear once the gay guys come out in the 1960s was Three Bells on University Avenue. Uh, you also get things like in northeastern Wisconsin, the Astor Hotel Bar, uh, in Green Bay, the Mayfair Lounge, the Spanish View Grill. In Appleton, the Conway Hotel is listed in the early gay guys, mm -hmm. as well as the Oshkosh Rolf, Rolf <coughs> Rock, Hotel Bar. Uh, the Green Bay guy continues with those three bars in uh, many times, uh, as does the Conway. In 69, Gale's Bar was added, and recently when I was in Green Bay, so I came up and said, oh, did you know Gale's Bar? No, not really, but I think it was a guy's. Uh, and in 1969, the gay guys uh, for the Northeast listed Point Beach State Forest, uh, seven miles north of Two Rivers, as a cruising ground where one might go. So, uh, gay men began to make connections uh, in the pre Stonewall period. Uh, for lesbians, women's softball apparently was one of the ways that they made connections. Uh, one of the people that I know who's on this team was Doris Hansen, uh, who lived a fairly active open life in her later days with her partner uh, in Madison. Uh, now, one of the things that I sort of wind up by one with is the 1966 Young Dems meeting in Manitowoc, uh, where they adopted what became known as the sex plan. Uh, the Young Dems had sort of had a movement going on of slightly more radical campus types taking over from the sort of city of Young Dems. And the Madison campus had proposed a motion, a resolution to go to the state convention according to freedom of action to homosexuals, by which they meant basically decriminalizing homosexuality. Uh, the Milwaukee campus had a similar kind of resolution. They both got combined uh, at the state convention, and they were adopted reasonably well, but not overwhelmingly. And then afterwards, you got a number of conservative Dems who started to complain. And uh, this made actually the national newspapers with Governor Warren Knowles said that Homocrats versus these conservative Democrats was just a little too much uh, to happen. Uh, by, uh, this was the first political group in the nation to make a record on behalf of gay folks in the country later that same year a couple other young Dem groups picked it up. By 1973, when I was part of going to the state Democratic conventions, uh, we had adopted resolutions also supporting similar activities. And by 1976, 10 years after the Young Dems, was actually in the Democratic platform published in the blue book about decriminalizing sexual activity and supporting uh, non-discrimination legislation. So uh, the, what I'm trying to argue is, is that what happens in volume one is this setup for a real blooming of gay rights activity and political activity uh, in the state. And so hopefully, Wisconsin will be different than what this image suggested at the beginning of the talk. Uh, and just giving you a little taste for volume two. Uh, in 1982, you may recall that Wisconsin legislature passed the first in the nation gay rights bill. Uh, and a whole bunch of other legislation that I talk about in the 1980s, uh, including hate crimes legislation based on sexual orientation. Uh, and uh, Wisconsin is the only state in the nation to have elected three out U.S. congresspersons in 
our state senator, Jenny Bolg, and Congressman uh, Mark Pocan, and former Congressman Steve Gunderson. I'd say it must be something in the water, the beer, the cheese, I don't know what. But Wisconsin has a remarkable record, and it needs to be understood and told. So that's what I'm trying to do. So at that, I'd be glad to take some questions. Sure. What the heck is Stonewall? Oh, what the heck is Stonewall? I'm glad you mentioned that because there are certain folks who don't know. Stonewall uh, was a, a series of nights of riots that happened in New York City. The Stonewall Inn was a bar that was popularized by uh, very young gay men, uh, some lesbians and some trans persons uh, in Greenwich Village. Uh, the police raided it as they used to do a lot of gay bars. Uh, it was in 1969, June of 1969, which is why you have pride parades which occur in June today all across the country and even around the world because they started celebrating that anniversary of Stonewall. The first uh, pride parade was in 1970 on the first anniversary when there was a parade in New York and there was also a parade uh, in LA. So uh, that's the origin of all of our gay prides is Stonewall. I'm sure. Thank, thank you both. That's the thing that I try to say is that our history has not been told. It has been erased. And I'm trying to unerase the erasure is what I'm trying to do. Okay. So um, in Wisconsin, or locally, we did a, the History Museum did an exhibit on yeah. mental health and the asylum specifically. Okay. And we were going through records around McCarthy time of why people were sent to the uh, local asylum. And sure. a lot of what was listed were sexual perversion. Yeah. And um, we were wondering if that was, in fact, actually LGBTQ folks who were Definitely there. was. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the original cyber law was crimes against nature based on Tudor law. Uh, there was a movement to update the penal code, and Wisconsin actually was one of those sort of leaders, as we are in often things. And we updated our penal code before sort of the victimless crimes movement had taken over. And so what they did was they replaced the sodomy law with sexual perversion. Uh, okay. So sexual perversion was indeed the same crime of sodomy. Uh, but it was written to be more inclusive, i.e. it could include lesbians as well as men, uh, which the English common law had not really done. Yeah, there were some unmarried women too, that that was what they were listed as, as unmarried women. Right, yes, yeah. that, that was sexual perversion, that was us, clearly. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the role of the churches, because sure. you know, um, I remember being a Lutheran going to, for some reason to a sex ed by my pastor, yeah. where they said that homosexuals should not be in prison, they should be treated. Okay. And he spent a lot of time defending that because apparently before that, homosexuals right. should be in jail. Right. And I was wondering if there, there's a, how you see them as affecting um, um, these During the pre stone law period, there was not hardly any sort of sense of that. There would have, part of what, what happens as sort of Freud becomes more popular, and that's when you get the psychiatrists doing the screaming in World War I, is that it starts to be seen as a sickness. And one of the things that Gillen does in his book is that he has a couple pages on uh, the origins of homosexuality. He discusses as an academic the various theories about homosexuality. He doesn't do that on murderers, you know, like murderers are just murderers, you know. But about homosexuals, he begins to translate that from the criminal to a scientific point of view. So that movement was occurring a little bit. It hadn't really influenced much of the churches pre Stonewall. Uh, in the second volume, I do talk about how various denominations, some main lines, the Lutherans become supportive of decriminalizing homosexuality, uh, though that varies by denomination of Lutherans. Uh, Wisconsin City and Missouri City, not so much. The Lutheran Church of America and the other group that becomes part of the ELCA, yes. Um, and uh, so you get shifting positions starting to occur uh, after Stonewall, but it, it's quite a while. There is, a, and again in volume two, I talk about the Council on Religion and the Homosexual group that gets started in the early 70s in Milwaukee by a Lutheran minister. And uh, Herbert King, he's actually with the Missouri Synod, but while he's trying to do this work, the Missouri Synod actually comes out and 
against homosexuality. Uh, but this group of the Council on Religion and Homosexuality started, has an effect in that the state Methodist in 76 adopt a statement that's much more sympathetic. And then Marjorie Matthews, who was the first female Methodist bishop uh, in the nation, and she was here in Wisconsin, uh, becomes a speaker for decriminalizing homosexuality. Uh, later, she gets joined in the gay rights bill by a number of Episcopal and Lutheran bishops as well, uh, and that's in 82. So that there's, some of them are moving uh, during this direction, but it takes a while for them to get there. Yes, So when they were um, going and attacking these students and you know, trying to interview right. them, did they actually have to be caught in an act to be accused? Of something, or did they was just hearsay or suspected they were doing something, and then they would call them into interviews? Some of them, it, it, it varied over this period. Some of them might be a ruling, might complain about somebody. Some of them were entrapped, I would say, in restrooms, where certain restrooms were known as places where you could have homosexual sex, and the campus police would go there and try and sort of see if they were sending signals. They might not actually, actually be in a sex act, but they might seem to be offering that. And so the police would take that as a serious enough official to take them to the station. Um, you know, in, in the purge in 62, they were just asking for names of anybody we knew was homosexual, and they would put them on the list, and they had a list of hundreds of homosexuals. Uh, and many, one of those persons attempted to suicide, others were denied financial aid, uh, you know, so it was serious. One of the things I mentioned, there were no lesbian cases, in part, the dean of women, part of the time, was a lesbian herself, uh, and not inclined to persecute other lesbians uh, on campus. But lesbians were probably more discreet, I mean, uh, you know, the number of men who were in tea rooms was probably not a high percentage, but there certainly were some. There were two students who were picked up who were sort of in a car um, necking along the Willow Drive on the university, and that led them to find an invitation to a party uh, uh, off campus on West Adams, and then they raided that house, found obscene material, charged those and other people who were part of that network in the 48 uh, crackdown. So it, it, it was very, uh, most often they were not actually caught in do you have any like family stories as far as like people being, oh yes, I know I had a, a great aunt or great uncle who lived with a partner for several years. Uh, in my family, the story was my grandma was telling me that oh aunt so and so lived with aunt so and so for 50 years, but right. they were just roommates. My grandpa sat across the table and said no. They weren't roommates. <laughs> they were partners. Yeah, and, and sure. it was a very like, right. what? What are you saying? Uh, How uh, can you uh, say uh, that? Uh, uh, and it was just kind of hilarious for me being all open to them at that time right. to, to see that interaction and with, you know complete denial on her part, right. or whatever she was told right. growing up, yeah. you know, kind of thing staying with her. And my grandpa was a teacher and worked with me. Okay. Yeah, it was not uncommon that flight fictions were accepted. Uh, rather than explanations being explicit. Um, I had several bachelor uncles, uh, great uncles actually, you know, who never married and uh, you know, you always wonder about those, but you know, the records are totally non-existent. In fact, you know, the thing is they get wiped out because nobody's saving their family pictures even. I happen to have something that I think they were in a local brewery at that shows them, so I can actually have images of them. But other than that, So, um, yeah, erasure of, of like, you know, denials are often what we face uh, in the past. So, yes. points of like, yes. You had said at one point in time that um, homosexuals in education and medicine were frowned upon. Right. So, what is the story now of that? Oh, uh, the, the School of Education at the Madison campus has no qualms about having, you know, gay women and lesbians or trans persons as part of their students. Uh, I, I know lots of gay doctors in town as well. So, I mean, it, it, it's turned around uh, from what it was. But, I mean, 
you know, some of the early fights about non-discrimination law, uh, and Madison had an ordinance in 1975, uh, and there was a group of evangelical pastors who tried to create an exemption for people who were in teaching and stuff like that because they didn't think uh, gay folks or lesbians should be teachers. Uh, and so they wanted an exemption from non-discrimination for those kinds of professions. Um, there's also a lot of material that I have that I can cover in the second book about the gay and lesbian uh, educators and educational employees in Madison where they organized that even though there was a non-discrimination law in the city, it would have applied to teachers who were in the school system. Uh, they nevertheless would find uh, faggot or lesbian uh, written on their cars, or students would denounce them. And so they basically organized to try and find mutual support, and also to raise the issues of gay and lesbians in the school system, and brought photo exhibits and other things like that that began to educate folks that, yes, uh, you shouldn't be discriminated against. There's early books like uh, One Teenager in Ten and Two Teenagers in Twenty, which begin to talk about some of the young people's and their experiences. And this mass group that I mentioned, they also published various stories written by young gay and lesbian students in their newsletter, some of which are just remarkable uh, when you read them. Uh, and there's a wonderful woman in the New Bay area, Ellen Littig, uh, who did early uh, programming on gay and lesbian, gay and lesbian teens that went on educational TV uh, shown nationwide that she produced, uh, and she ran a, uh, had a multiple page teacher's guide of materials that teachers could use as well uh, in the 1990s. So, I mean, there were people fighting to change all of that, but that was certainly a perception uh, going back in this pre stone Yeah, Jim. Other questions, thoughts, comments? I'm going to learn. Yes. Just a footnote. Yes. I you covered the area so well. Is it? Uh, I'm thinking of Edna Ferber, the yes. novelist uh, right. who born in Appleton. Right. Uh, does she play any have any relationship to your subject matter, or she, did she just go to the East Coast and live her own life and disappear? She basically did did do that, uh, but she did write about uh, Hurley, <coughs> one of her novels. Okay. Uh, as you know, sort of a wide open town. Uh, and one of the characters there comes from a house of prostitution, which she had managed and then becomes established, I think, in Oshkosh uh, in a large family uh, situation. So, um, but I mean, you know, there's lots of other uh, gay and lesbian novelists who are writing, uh, and later there becomes a number of authors and poets in Wisconsin who publish, as well as some academics on Madison. Milwaukee and uh, Eau Claire campuses who publish. Uh, so, Stephen's point, in fact, the first book, The Gay Academic, uh, that comes out following Stonewall, uh, was edited by Louis Crew, who would soon after that teach at the University of Wisconsin, Stephen's point. Uh, and I got to know Louis uh, in the early days as well. I think Farm Boys is a remarkable. Right, Will's book. Poetry. Will has helped me a lot with my research, given me lots of hints. and. Uh, been very encouraging, so I give a lot of credit to Will for his pioneering work. Other comments, questions? Yes. Um, you talked about um, uh, many lesbians um, being and not finding themselves imprisoned in right. uh, insane asylums. Right. Did you come across any material or documentation on were they just treated like the normal population there? Or was there any special treatment or experimentation being done? I don't know. That? I don't know the answer to that. I did not look at the institutions themselves. Um, there's a little bit of literature that cures uh, about gay men and sort of how they play the game. But I don't know of the information about those things. But I, there, there may be something or if not, you know, one of the things that I, I was working on, I, I research I love to do research. Uh, but my book coach said, kept saying, write, get it together in a book, because you've got to get it published. And he was right. So, but I think of 10 dissertation topics, you know, that I passed over that somebody else could easily pick up and do. So, 
Um, you know, there's a ton of women's colleges in Wisconsin, you know, or all those others besides Downer, which of course merged with Lawrence here, uh, you know, breeding domestic friendships as well. Probably, but as I did research that, no, not that I know. So, uh, anyway, there's lots of lots more work to be done about this history. Yeah, I hope many people will do it. Anything else? If not, uh, thank you all for coming. We have books available there that you can buy if you want. I'll be glad to sign if you also want that. And, uh, you know, learn more about your own local history. Help preserve it. One of the things I'm doing right now is working on an LBGT archive with UW Madison. Milwaukee has one. Uh, they have some at Green Bay, which I hope they're going to do more and get into a good archive. So don't let our history be thrown away. Too often, people clean out eggs and there it goes. It shouldn't happen. Yes? Uh, the reason I came here today is because uh, two years ago, I returned to live in Wisconsin after being gone for 37 years. Wow. Okay. Where were you? Uh, out in New York. Okay. Um, I'm an out and proud gay, gay person. But uh, I was very hesitant about returning to Wisconsin to live because I just felt, I still feel, that uh, we are way too conservative based on where I moved here from. Okay. However, this is enlightening. So I just wanted to share that with you. Okay, good. And to thank you for presenting this today and right. writing a book about it that you know tells the history of right. our struggle. So well, thank you. In, in book two, I have an appendix of like over 70 LBGP office holders in Wisconsin in the period post Hall. And they range from like Winnebago County Board to you know Waukesha City Council to lots of Dane County folks and Madison City Council folks. So state legislators as well, so. But they, they were out? Out. Most of them, yeah, most of them oh. were out, or don't come down with no. Some of them were not out in the press. This became a more common term after 1980, but some yeah. of them were certainly known. We were in a corner in Iowa County, and there were lots of folks who were mm -hmm. very open about who they were. Good to know. Yeah.